Hey guys, so yesterday we got probably the biggest news for the Middle Earth fandom since we found out that Amazon had acquired rights to make a TV show. Multiple outlets have reported that Warner Brothers and New Line Cinema have struck a deal with the Embracer Group, who now owns Middle Earth Enterprises, to make more movies in the world of Middle Earth. Now, I wanted to cover what we know this means and just as importantly, what it does not mean. There's a lot of speculation happening and I thought it would be good to clear some things up before adding some speculation of my own, including a list of potential stories that could be adapted. And finally, I'll explain why I think the film and TV rights from Middle Earth being with two different studios may be a big win for fans. One of the first misconceptions I'm seeing floating around, even in some news outlet headlines, is that Warner Brothers are remaking The Lord of the Rings. And there's zero indication this is the case. A direct quote from the folks at Warner Brothers says, but for all the scope and detail lovingly packed into the two trilogies, the vast, complex, and dazzling universe dreamed up by J.R.R. Tolkien remains largely unexplored on film. The opportunity to invite fans deeper into the cinematic world of Middle Earth is an honor, and we are excited to partner with Middle Earth Enterprises and Embracer on this adventure. The key phrase here is that they're going deeper into the world of Middle Earth. Another quote mentions honoring the past as they look to the future. While I will continue to proclaim that an animated series of The Hobbit or Lord of the Rings would be great and could return many of the original cast as voice actors and finally give us Tom Bombadil in The Scouring of the Shire, they're clearly looking at other stories from Middle Earth to tell at the present. From my understanding, Warner Brothers essentially has the same rights in film form that Amazon has for TV. That being the pages of The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings, including the appendices found at the end of The Lord of the Rings. A quick note, if you'll recall from The Hobbit days, MGM owns the distribution rights to The Hobbit, while Warner Brothers has the production rights. I've not seen any update on this aspect whatsoever, but if this is still the case, it would mean that Amazon, who bought MGM last year, would now own distribution to any future Hobbit films. So just as before, Warner Brothers has the rights to make but not release films based on The Hobbit, and MGM, now Amazon, has the rights to distribute such films but not make them. Yeah, it's kind of a mess. But as we said, they're not talking remakes, so that likely won't be a factor here. Another quick clarification, there's nothing from the Silmarillion, Unfinished Tales, or other First Age Tolkien books at play here. So no First Age stories are on the table for potential adaptations. Those rights still remain with the Tolkien estate and would have to be negotiated directly with them. Another big question is, will these new stories in Middle-earth tie into the existing world created by Peter Jackson in his six films? We already know that the War of the Rohirrim anime film in production at Warner Brothers will. They've even brought on some of the key players from The Lord of the Rings in artists John Howe and Alan Lee, Richard Taylor and Weta, and Philippa Boyens. It's also worth noting that after news of the Warner Brothers Embracer agreement dropped, Peter, Fran, and Philippa released a statement saying, Warner Brothers and Embracer have kept us in the loop every step of the way. We look forward to speaking with them further to hear their vision for the franchise moving forward. Now, I don't know if Peter Jackson has a desire to go back to Middle Earth, but with all the things we've learned in the decades since the release of the Hobbit films, like the insanely short pre-production time he was working with, combined with the studio mandates to make three films instead of two, and to add in the awful love triangle element, I'd love to see Peter get a chance to return to Middle Earth with a proper production timeline and without studio interference. Should Peter Jackson not be involved, or his aesthetic for Middle Earth not be pursued, I don't think it's necessarily a death knell for these projects. There's certainly room for other visions of Middle Earth to come to fruition. Just as I was excited by the idea of Guillermo del Toro's vision of The Hobbit that regretfully didn't come to pass, it could be cool to see a different vision for the world. That being said, there's no denying the incredible achievement Peter, Fran, Philippa, Weta, and the entire team accomplished on the Lord of the Rings trilogy. In my opinion, it remains far and away the best and certainly the most successful visual adaptation of Tolkien's world. And returning to that cinematic vision is the possibility I find most intriguing. Naturally, after learning the new movies are coming and learning they're not remaking The Lord of the Rings, fans immediately launch into speculation of what stories might they tell in these new films. And while some may be anticipating some crappy cash grabs like Bard the Bowman, Quest for the Black Arrow, 
I think there's some incredible stories in the pages of the appendices that, if done right and done well, could make for excellent films. Looking at the project currently in development at Warner Brothers, I think, gives us a clue to the stories they'll tell. The anime feature film War of the Rohirrim will tell the tale of Helm Hammerhand and the invasion of Rohan by the Dunlendings, a tale found in Appendix A of The Lord of the Rings. And immediately after hearing this news, I came up with half a dozen potential stories we could see, and added a few more to my list after our stream last night. Aeorl the Young. Sticking with the Rohirrim, it could be really cool to see an adaptation of how Rohan came to be. We'd follow their first king, Aeorl, as they come to Gondor's rescue in their battle against orcs and a group of Easterlings under Sauron known as the Balkoth. This story would also have the bonus of a potential cameo or small role for Galadriel as she briefly comes into the story. The Angmar War The most popular idea put forth by fans, including myself, has definitely been the Angmar War. Within this story, we would get the fall of Arnor, the mannish kingdom the Dúnedain Rangers, including Aragorn, descend from. As far as returning characters, the biggest would be the Witch King, who would serve as the main villain of the story. With the men of Arnor being descendants of Numenor, and the Witch King himself likely a former Numenorean lord, there's potential for interesting connections between the two warring factions, not to mention flashbacks. This war takes place over the course of nearly 600 years, and depending on how in-depth they're willing to go into this war and the various victories and defeats, it could potentially be a multi-movie series. Aside from the Witch King, we could see the return of Elrond, whose realm of Rivendell is at one point besieged by the Witch King during this war. Galadriel and Celeborn eventually send reinforcements from Lorien, so we could see them return as well. Perhaps most exciting would be the possible debut of fan favorite Glorfindel, the great elf warrior who foretells that not by the hand of man shall the Witch King fall. And let's not forget, the hobbits actually send fighters to the climactic Battle of Fornost. Young Aragorn. We know this was one of the ideas pitched for Amazon series years ago, but another potential tale is the story of Aragorn before the events of The Lord of the Rings. After the tragic death of his father when he's just two years old, Aragorn is raised in Rivendell by Elrond. After going on early adventures with Elrond's sons, Eladan and Elrohir, Aragorn would go on journeys of his own in the lands of Rohan and Gondor. The climax of such an adaptation could be Aragorn's battle with the Corsairs of Umbar, before he sets his sights to travel to the south and east. Again, such a story could see the return of Elrond, as well as the debut of Eladan and Elrohir. It would require a recast of Aragorn to portray a younger version, though I wonder if we could see a brief return of Liv Tyler as Arwen. The War in the North. Not to be confused with the video game of the same name, this popular option would be the one closest in timeline to The Lord of the Rings. While we're all familiar with the War of the Ring in the south of Middle-earth, simultaneously there are battles being waged in the north. The lands of Dale and Erebor are besieged by Easterlings, while the realms of Lorien and Thranduil's halls are attacked by orcs from Dol Guldur. This would tie in most strongly to Peter Jackson's existing six films, as we would see familiar locations like Dale, Erebor, Mirkwood, and Lorien, as well as some key returning characters that don't factor into the events happening simultaneously in The Return of the King. Galadriel, Celeborn, Thranduil, and Dane Ironfoot could all return to play major roles, in addition to King Brand of Dale, the grandson of King Bard the Bowman who we met in The Hobbit. And while those are some of the ideas with the most immediate potential, there's yet more. There's the War of the Dwarves and Orcs, which we briefly glimpsed in The Hobbit trilogy, though with some pretty major changes to the books. The War of the Dwarves and Dragons, which would take place after the fall of Khazad-dûm and tell how the dwarves came to live in Erebor. The Kinstrife in Gondor, which is essentially the tale of a civil war in the Great Southern Realm. There's Balin's expedition to Moria, of which we see the aftermath in The Fellowship of the Ring and features a few of the dwarves we met in The Hobbit. And in one of the few tales that could take place after The Lord of the Rings, they could tread the same ground as the upcoming Return to Moria video game and tell a tale about Durin the Seventh leading the dwarves to finally reclaim Moria. Just as an aside, it could be really cool if we're able to tell this in such a way where Durin remembers his former lives, 
and we use those flashbacks to tell the overall story of the dwarves and Khazad Doom. And if Warner Brothers chose to play in the same sandbox as the Rings of Power, they could even look to the Second Age, perhaps telling a story of the creation of the Rings of Power and the War of the Last Alliance, which we saw in the prologue of The Fellowship of the Ring. There's obviously no shortage of stories that could be told here. The most important thing to me, and I think to most if not all fans, is that the stories are adapted well. We've seen adaptations of Middle-earth for over 50 years now, ranging from incredible masterpieces to mind-bogglingly terrible. The monster lizard slag the terrible. But if things are done well and done right, and capture the magic of Tolkien's world and the heart of his stories, it could make for some great films. Finally, I want to touch on the uniqueness of the situation we're in. We now have two different studios with rights to produce adaptations from the pages of The Lord of the Rings, The Appendices, and The Hobbit. After Amazon acquired the TV rights, I said Warner Brothers retaining the film rights could be a big win for fans because it would naturally breed competition. Say War of the Rohirrim rides in in April 2024 and just absolutely rocks. With more Warner Brothers productions on the way, that will absolutely put pressure on Amazon to up their game on the Rings of Power and whatever other projects they may wish to pursue. And the same is true in reverse. If War of the Rohirrim flounders and Rings of Power season two wows fans, that will put pressure on Warner Brothers to make their future films better. Now, obviously the hope is that the adaptations we get from both studios are great, but I think each studio knowing someone else is out there making Middle Earth adaptations and vying for fans' attention and adoration could be a win for us fans. However this plays out, it's sure to be interesting and hopefully will result in some great stories being told from Middle Earth. And finally, I'll leave you with one last wildly speculative, hypothetical situation to discuss in the comments. Seriously, I'm gonna go nuts here, so fair warning. Imagine if, come San Diego Comic-Con this July, Warner Brothers has a Middle Earth panel to announce upcoming projects. They begin by announcing the creation of an overseeing executive producer type role to oversee this, for lack of a better term, Middle Earth cinematic universe. We can call it the me -see you And they introduce this person by bringing onto the stage Sir Peter Jackson. Peter then goes on to announce one or two upcoming projects in early stages of development, both being filmed in New Zealand with effects by Weta. Perhaps they announce The Angmar War, a film or two, maybe even a trilogy, depicting the epic 600-year struggle of the men and elves of Eriador against the Witch King. Or a War in the North film, welcoming to the stage the returning cast of Kate Blanchett as Galadriel, Martin Sokas as Celeborn, and Lee Pace as Thranduil. Or maybe a young Aragorn film, telling the early life and adventures of the future king. Peter now welcomes to the stage Hugo Weaving returning as Elrond, and Viggo Mortensen, not returning as Aragorn, but taking on the role of director. He returns to Middle-earth to help craft this story and pick a young, relatively unknown, up-and-coming actor he can coach and mold into a younger version of his iconic character. And while we're at it, maybe they announce the returns of John Howe, Alan Lee, and Howard Shore for at least one of these films. And down the road, if War of the Rohirrim is a hit, perhaps they announce an Aorl the Young follow-up animated feature. I will say I'm certainly not looking for a massive slate like Marvel. Even they have recently talked about pulling back on their number of projects per year. Let's just hope Warner Brothers is wise enough to go at a realistic pace and emphasize quality over quantity here. Like I said, it's all wild speculation at this point. I'm sure some will be bursting with excitement at what I just laid out and others cringing in terror at what's to come. Personally, I'm pumped about this news and some of the possibilities give me chills just thinking about them. I've always said we can't get great adaptations of Tolkien's world if adaptations aren't being made. It's true now, just as it was true back before the Lord of the Rings trilogy even began filming. Come what may, I'm gonna enjoy the ride as we learn more about these projects, and as any good adaptation will also do, point people toward the books, which will always be the best place to experience the magic of Middle-earth. As always, I wanna say a huge thank you to my Patreon supporters who make this channel possible. Tom to Bombadil 19, Listen Me the Cinda, Kella Brimbor, The Mighty Mim, Team Weasel, Rabbi Rob Thomas, Charles Leisure, Toby Mobs Music, CCDC Red Team, Nerd Sigman Anytimer, Pelkey Sports Cards, Mookie the Brown, Christopher Carbaugh, Joe Tepper, 
Sky Carcass, Slide Belts, Dane Ragnarsson, Salim Rahman, Zetrock, Berto Berg, Grand Strategy Nerd, Graham Derricott, The Dark Haired One, Wyland, Michael Wu, Grant McGregor, and Debbie. If you enjoyed the artwork in this video, check out the artists in the description and purchase prints of their great work for yourself. Thanks so much for watching and subscribing, and we'll see you next time on Nerd of the Rings.